So, so the first story relates to our efforts to create what I call 3D histology. It's mostly the work of Daniel Kirschenbaum and Francesca Catto. MD PhD student uh, Daniel and the PhD student Francesca. And I, I have to say that uh, methods development is the toughest thing you can do. Because, and it's always methods development is what really drives science. Uh, I mean, if you think uh, now the Nobel Prize for CRISPR, hey, it, that is methods development. And uh, once the method is there, then you don't need to be a genius in order to do the wonderful science with it. Uh, the tough part is to get the stuff to work. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, across the board a truth. Uh, and uh, so, um, so these two guys uh, have spent the past five years uh, trying to get the stuff to work. And uh, something works, not everything. But I will tell you essentially what, uh, what works and what doesn't. Uh, so um, this was uh, the original Clarity technology that was pioneered by Carl Dyseroth. Um, who, in my opinion, is, is another hot candidate for a Nobel Prize. And, uh, and what Carl did uh, was, uh, he's a professor in Stanford. Uh, he's most famous for optogenetics, but actually he also invented this clarity thing. And what essentially, what uh, his technology consisted of uh, immersing, uh, submerging a, um, uh, brains uh, in, uh, in buffer within an electrical field. And then the idea was that uh, the mixture of SDS in the electrical field would actually pull out the lipids from the brain. And the lipids is really what, uh, what makes tissue non-transparent, because, uh, because at every interface between the aqueous phase and the lipid phase, there you have um, um, a change in the refractory index. And this is what scatters the light. So and if the light is scattered many times, then of course you cannot see through. And uh, so this is really the reason why we are not transparent. And, uh, the, so, so the idea was that if you actually pull out the lipids and everything becomes aqueous, then you should actually be able to see through. And indeed, the actu this actually works. And uh, the, um, uh, yeah, uh, with some um, uh, restrictions. So, uh, one of the problems is that this technology does not work as well as uh, we all hoped. Uh, and in fact, many people have started to do this uh, but it, uh, they gave up. And really, Daniel had uh, this intuition, which uh, you could argue is a bit of the egg of Columbus, because what he thought is, OK, you know, maybe it doesn't work so well because uh, the uh, conductivity of the tissue is much lower than that of the buffer meaning that uh, the electrons, uh, they will all go around the tissue. So he thought, OK, maybe we can actually put an insulating layer in between and separate the anode from the cathode. And now this will force uh, the electrical field to actually pass through the tissue. I mean, again, it, it looks very trivial when, uh, when I explain this to you like this. Uh, but you know, it, uh, nobody thought about it. And, uh, so, um, so it turns out that this works wonderfully, and you can clarify a brain within a couple of hours. It's extremely fast. We have also clarified human tissues and small biopsies, like prostate biopsies. And so needle biopsies, you can clarify, make them completely transparent within 10 minutes, so, which means that you can even do this intraoperatively for human diagnostics. And then the question is, uh, OK, now you have a piece of tissue that is transparent, but what do you do with it? How can you? Uh, you know, you will have to stain it because otherwise there is no use to it. And uh, and there again, the idea was, okay, maybe we can use uh, electrical fields uh, for that as well. And uh, well, first of all, dyes are typically very expensive. You, you, you think of uh, labeled antibodies, and so so. The idea was you cannot really dilute this in 100 milliliter of buffer because you know this will be just uh, you know it will break the bank. And uh, so. So Daniel and Francesca decided that they could actually confine the dye to a small volume by embedding it into low melting agarose. And now you have like a plug of low melting agarose on top. And now you use, again, you use, because the, 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 the antibodies will be um, uncharged. But once you couple them to fluorochromes, the fluorochromes are typically, they're highly charged. And now you can, again, you, you can use electrophoresis to drive the dyes through the tissue. 
this turns out to work pretty well. And actually, the, um, what we have found is that uh, the best uh, the best dyes, uh, you know, I'm interested in amyloids in uh, um, protein aggregates, and uh, and uh, there, there there are some wonderful dyes uh, which are called uh, luminescent conjugated polymers or polythiophenes. The thiophen is this. Uh, um, pentagonal ring. It contains uh, one atom of sulfur and four atoms of uh, carbon. And uh, it's conjugated uh, because... Uh, huh. Anybody of you remember some organic chemistry? What does it mean when uh, something is conjugated? It has nothing to do with uh, biotin conjugation or whatever. What is a conjugated system in chemistry? <laughs> I see that you guys perhaps uh, you should uh, you should uh, you should uh, read some uh, some uh, basic chemistry. I'm reading it again because I am uh, uh, helping my daughter with uh, with her gymnasium chemistry, and uh, so I uh, so now I am an expert. Uh, and uh, and uh, the um, but uh, essentially what this means is that you have alternating double bonds and single bonds. Uh, you see, here is double, here is single, here is double, here is single. And that creates uh, what is called a pi electron system. So you have an electron cloud uh, over the entire uh, molecule. And, uh, and this is one of the reasons that makes these compounds highly fluorescent. Uh, and uh, the other thing that is very, uh, very good about these uh, compounds is that uh, the single bonds uh, allows for uh, um, uh, various geometries. Uh, the thiophenes, they can be planar, they can be planar to each other, or they can be orthogonal to each other, or they can orient in any kind of uh, way. And for example, you can manipulate this. For example, if you, um, if you add uh, carboxy residues here, so COOH minus, uh, and now you can protonate or deprotonate uh, the carboxy residues but simply by changing the pH. Uh, and this will cause uh, the polythiophene, uh, so the residues, the side chains, will attract or repel electrically, electrostatically. And this will cause the thiophene to change its conformation. And then now the great thing, and this is really the big trick about this, uh, is that uh, uh, if the conformation changes, uh, you end up with different uh, um, spectra. The, and in fact, uh, this is the same polythiophene. It's polythiophenic acetic acid. And you see that at three different pH, uh, you get completely different colors. Uh, it's, the same, it's the same compound. So um, wonderful. Now we have a pretty sophisticated pH meter. And, uh, but what else can we do with it? Uh, well, all of this was done actually by Peter Nielsen. Peter Nielsen uh, is an is a organic chemist, uh, and he did his PhD. He created these compounds during his PhD. And then 10 years ago, uh -huh, longer, but 13 years ago, he came to my lab for a postdoc. And he had this idea, said, look, I want to use the, my compounds uh, to stain uh, biological molecules. Uh, and uh, so, and I told him, well, you know, we do something great now, because there is this thing with the prion strains, and, uh, you know, I just don't understand it, and everybody is interested in prion strains. So, um, how many of you have heard about uh, prion strains, or A-beta strains, or tau strains, synuclein strains? Uh, did anybody hear about this? Uh, you? Nobody else? Uh, you did? Okay, okay. Uh, so, then I have to harken back a little bit. And... Uh, um, well, but you know what a prion is. I mean, a prion is essentially a protein-only infectious agent, and the way the prions work is essentially that they make uh, aggregates, and then these aggregates, they grow like crystals, and then they elongate and make fibers, and the fibers break, and that's when uh, you have two prions, and then this um, propagates all the time. But uh, what is really strange is that these prions, they come in strains, meaning that one prion will create, for example, a disease within a couple of months. The other prion will create a disease in two years. And so the strains are completely different phenotypically, but you can propagate these strains in the same uh, genetic strain of mice serially. And because the mice are genetically identical, the primary sequence of the prion will be the same. So it has remained uh, a mystery for 40 years. Uh, why? 
how can you possibly encode the different proteins with different uh, phenotypic properties if the genetics is the same? So, uh, so the question was really, what is it, what, how do you encipher the, proper, the strain property of a prion if you can't use the genetics? Because the genetics is identical in all cases. You understand this? So my idea was, well, you know, maybe, uh, I mean, this was a bit naive, but uh, uh, I thought, uh, you know, if you have bricks uh, and you have to make a house uh, with exactly the same bricks, uh, you can make very different houses. And I thought, maybe it's the same here. Maybe you, uh, you have uh, just one prion and it always looks the same. It's a misfolded prion protein. So you have the cellular normal prion protein, then you have the misfolded protein. And then the misfolded protein will aggregate and will create the actual uh, transmissible prion. But uh, the quaternary structure, the supramolecular arrangement of the prion may actually be different. Uh, well, if that is the case, uh, then, uh, and this was a big, big if, uh, but if that is the case, then maybe the polythiophene could actually resolve this uh, because, uh, the, because uh, the distance between the thiophene rings uh, is around five angstrom. Uh, now, the distance between the beta sheets uh, in, the, in the stack, of, in the prion stack, uh, is uh, between 10 and 11 angstrom. Uh, so the hope was that two thiophene rings uh, may actually have the correct periodicity to intercalate in the, um, uh, in the prion aggregate. Now, but because, uh, but if the theory is correct, uh, if the idea is really that you have different uh, conformations, then actually when the thiophene intercalates, uh, it may acquire a different conformation in the different strains. And because, uh, and then we can read it out by, uh, by flu spectrofluorimetry because uh, the, the colors will be different. Uh, so uh, bottom, uh, bottom line, so this was the work, um, uh, the work of uh, Peter Nielsen when he was a postdoc with me and Christina Sigurdsson who is now a professor at UCSD. They were both postdocs at the time and they actually pulled it out. And so they had a beautiful paper in Nature Methods where they actually showed that you get different colors from different, uh, um, yeah, from different prion strains. And that was really the first demonstration that uh, the strain properties, the strainness of the prion could actually be encoded within um, the quaternary structure of the protein. And then, of course, uh, we, uh, you know, this is uh, indirect evidence, but, uh, but then I was really interested in finding out uh, the, stru the real structure. And uh, then we got together with uh, Beat Meyer, who is a solid state NMR specialist at ETH. And uh, Willie Herman was an MD PhD student in my lab. And what, uh, uh, what they eventually did, and this was the work of Anne Schutz in the lab of uh, Beat Meyer, to actually resolve the structure of uh, a polythiophene complex with a prion fibril. And, uh, and, now, and now we understand a lot of things. Now, for example, we understand that the thiophenes themselves, they end up in this hydrophobic groove of the fibril. And uh, the, in the case of polythiophenic acetic acid, uh, we, they interact, uh, so these are uh, negative, uh, negatively charged residues, and they interact with lysines on the surface of the prion. And these interactions are, are very weak. But uh, in this case, you have four of them. And then actually, the affinity or the avidity is the, the product of the affinity of each one of the interactive moieties. And then eventually, you end up with a very, very strong affinity. And in fact, to, to the extent uh, that the affinity here is not even measurable, there is no off constant. You just don't get the thiophene out, uh, out of the fabric anymore. And then uh, uh, Amadeo Kaflisch did uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, where uh, he actually uh, measured the so-called unbinding energy, the actual energy that it takes to, ra uh, to wrangle the polythiophene out of the, um, of the prion fibril. And um, this looks like a really bad uh, uh, YouTube homemade movie, but uh, actually it took uh, uh, a long time for a supercomputer to actually calculate this. Uh, and, 
and now having the system for the, the molecular dynamics uh, right, for, now you can do in silico experiments. Now, so you can now make many different uh, polythiophenes in silico and ask which ones uh, will have uh, the strongest binding. And this was done, and then eventually we, went, we ended up with uh, thiophenes that are extremely strong, and this was really what Uli then used for the therapy of uh, mice to um, and, uh, and it's uh, amazing. I mean, you can uh, uh, extend the life of free infected mice by twice as much using the best polythiophenes. And this was the work in the science translational medicine work. And then essentially, and then we started thinking, okay, maybe we can use these polythiophenes to stain amyloids uh, using, uh, using in clarified tissue because they're strongly fluorescent, so you actually you should be able to see them. And for that, we first uh, we invented a little machine that is 3D printable, and you can actually download uh, uh, the plants, and then you can make it at your home or whatever. And uh, the um, and this works very well. And then, uh, how do you actually acquire uh, the uh, the 3D images? We do so by um, uh, doing selective plane illumination microscopy or SPIM. And uh, so maybe how many of you know how this PIM works? Uh, never heard of. Uh. So essentially, the, the, the SPIM is a microscope where the objective is perpendicular to the, to the light source. So essentially, you have a laser that is collimated, and then you have a cylindrical lens that creates a sheet out of the... Uh, uh, out of the laser, uh, of the punctiform laser source, uh, and now the sheet essentially c uh, makes an optical section through the through the tissue, but uh, you are recording it at 90 degrees. Uh, that is, you are making an image of everything that is illuminated by your laser source, and this is why it's, it's also called light sheet microscopy. And uh, um, we um, wanted to do this, but then it turned out that there was no machine uh, uh, available that you could buy that would do this in a reasonable way. So, so we actually made our, uh, uh, our own machine, and that was a collaboration with, uh, um, uh, with uh, um, uh, the Helmchen lab, Fritz of Helmchen and Fabian Vogt, and uh, this was just published in Nature Methods, and uh, essentially this is the machine. I, I know it doesn't look like a microscope, yeah, but the guy, oh, they put all the labels so you understand what it is. Here is a camera, here's the detection optics, uh, here is actually the cuvette with the sample, and the light comes in from the side. And then uh, here, you can, so this will be the excitation pathway. This is a chair, just in case you don't understand. Well, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, well, you know, they are trying to make fun, but anyway. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, then the, li the guys, they like many colors, so, so they uh, forced me to buy a bunch of lasers with different colors, so, we have, so that we have red, and we have blue, orange and uh, pink and whatever and then uh, they when they built the microscope they actually made a movie a time lapse movie so that uh, uh, so that you can now really I mean if you want to build it yourself you can uh, download the movie and uh, and uh, you can uh, uh, and essentially this contains all the instructions uh, for how to make it it takes two days but then you have it and um, right and um, uh, yes, uh, yes, I know. Uh, yeah, at some point, uh, they are lying on the on the table, on the optical table, which is probably not a very good idea. But uh, anyway, <laughs> and um, okay, so that was, uh, and then you can do great stuff, no? Because then the fun begins. So this is uh, a. Um, this is a brain of a mouse uh, that is transgenic for, a, for APP, and, uh, and uh, so it's an Alzheimer model. This mouse develops uh, Alzheimer plaques, and the polythiophenes are great for uh, detecting the Alzheimer plaques, and now you can actually record every single plaque uh, in this transgenic mouse, and there are approximately 150,000 of it, and, and uh, because uh, this is now, um, 
natively digital, it's perfectly uh, suitable for machine learning. You can immediately feed it into a pipeline, uh, into a machine learning pipeline, and then you can do amazing stuff. Now, for example, here we are looking at uh, a transgenic mouse that expresses GFP in endothelial cells. So, so now we can visualize every single capillary and uh, vein and artery, the entire vascular tree of the mouse brain, and on top of it, the plaques. So here we have the, the Alzheimer plaques detected with the polythiophanes, and all the vessels detected with the endogenous, uh, genetically encoded uh, um, green fluorescent protein. So now you can do things. No? Now you can ask the computer to, first of all, to enumerate all the vessels, to enumerate all the plaques, then to calculate uh, the distance between each plaque and the nearest vessel. And this, I thought this could be very useful for therapy because, uh, because you know, when you, when you take a drug, uh, the drug will come to the brain through the vessels. So, so it's, um, uh, intuitively, you would expect uh, that the distance between the vessel and the plaques uh, will be one of the determinants uh, of, um, of efficaciousness of therapy. So, um, so here we are actually looking at all the plaques and all the vessels. Uh, and uh, of course, because there is 150,000 of them, there is no way you can count this. But you can actually feed the whole thing into the computer because you can uh, segment the, I mean, there is very, very effective ways of uh, doing this uh, by image analysis. Uh, and uh, so we uh, hooked up with uh, uh, Jin Hyung Lee, who is a Korean scientist who works uh, in Stanford, and she's fantastic. She's uh, the best computer scientist I ever met. And, uh, and so she and her um, PhD student, Ezan, Ezan Dalgani, have uh, developed an entire computer pipeline, completely automated, to actually look at this in high throughput. So now we have been looking at hundreds uh, of mice, and we have been looking at therapies. So one of the questions that I had was, OK, I mean, there are a couple of um, potential treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, are they region-specific? Nobody knows about that, because nobody has been able yet to look at uh, treatment in a holistic way, looking at the entire um, it's the entire brain. So what we did was to take mice uh, that developed Alzheimer plaques and then to treat them with either with a base inhibitor, this is the beta secretase, is one of the enzymes that uh, create uh, the A-beta, the peptide that, the, that uh, provokes Alzheimer's disease, or with anti-A-beta antibodies, or with polythiophenes, because as Uli has already shown, the polythiophenes are very effective anti-amyloid agents. So uh, mice were treated for 90 days, and then the brain was recovered, was clarified using our technology, and then uh, segmented. Uh, it was uh, um, uh, the images were acquired by SPIM, by selective plane illumination microscopy, and then everything was. Uh, 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 Registered, which means that it is like morphing. You know? so you, because all these planes are, are a little different from each other, so what you do is that you take some anchor points and then you create and then you project uh, your experimental finding to an idealized brain, which is essentially the one from the from the Allen Brain Atlas. So and now you have a very standardized way of looking at um, at things. And now, I mean, I have to say that this is, I mean, this is amazing. If, uh, I mean, when I saw this, I mean, this really uh, knocked my socks off. And, uh, and uh, so, so you see here what happens. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you can do. No? You, you have a control mouse, which is just an APP mouse with a lot of plaques. Then you have a mouse that uh, has been treated with whatever compound, uh, base inhibitors or whatever. And now what you do is you calculate voxel by voxel. You calculate the likelihood that each voxel, that uh, the therapy has been effective. And you can, so you can calculate the probability on each voxel. And then you can, and then you heat map the voxels. Now, what you see here is very abstract. These, these are not plaques. What you see here is a, uh, representation of the probability that uh, the therapy has worked in a voxel-by-voxel voxel, uh, uh, distribution. So, so this is very powerful. 
because what you then can do eventually, you can take this is treatment one, and then you can treat with something else, and then you can compare, and then, and then you can ask, okay, I mean, do different treatments uh, hit different areas of the brain differentially? And uh, yes, they do. And, uh, and then you can, uh, so one of the things we do is uh, to simplify things is to make a couple of coronal sections uh, from, uh, from these 3D maps, which are a bit unwieldy, a bit difficult to visualize for a human brain. Uh, but you know, the results are amazing. I mean, this is, uh, okay, this is 100 terabytes of data. No? So it's, uh, it's something, uh, it takes a while to do it. And uh, the, uh, but, uh, so, uh, so this is a summary of summary statistic from 30 mice uh, treated with base inhibitor, 30 mice treated with uh, polythiophene, and uh, you know, I mean, it's incredible. The the base inhibitor hits only the basal part of the brain. The polythiophenes essentially hit only the upper part, the dorsal part of the brain. And uh, the it's almost uh, yes and no. It's almost positive and negative. And uh, um, now, what does this mean in practical terms? And again, uh, um, these are not plaques, what you're seeing here. What you're seeing here is the probability of efficaciousness um, of, your, um, of your compound. So this, is, so this will be highly effective against the plaques that are located here, and this will be highly effective against the plaques that are located here. Now, the, um, the interpretation is that different uh, therapies uh, have completely different uh, spatial uh, um, uh, uh, effects, impact uh, on, um, on different uh, brain areas. Uh, and now you can do fantastic stuff. And this is very, very new. This is actually what Ezan has done in the last couple of weeks. And, uh, and I mean, the guys wanted to, uh, to send out the paper. And I said, no, no, we have to do more. And you know, they said, well, you probably know how this thing is. No? The, the PI is never happy, and the students want to publish. And, uh, but anyway, I think that this time, and now, um, uh, the, the, so Daniel, Daniel was not happy at all. But, uh, I said, but last week, he told me, yeah, uh, you were right. I apologize. <laughs> so, so, and, <laughs> And uh, and uh, and I think that uh, I th yes, I think I was really right because uh, because what I asked them to do and uh, they eventually uh, I think that the results are fantastic. What I asked them to do was to take um, uh, published uh, atlases of spatial transcriptomics. Uh, where uh, you know people have done, for example, in situ hybridizations uh, on a lot of genes expressed in the brain uh, using serial sections, uh, and then you know, and the, uh, my question was uh, because we see this, uh, but what is the reason? I mean, why, why is uh, this compound active here and that other compound active there? So uh, one easy uh, hypothesis was, well, m you know, maybe. Maybe it's just uh, simply the dr distribution of the drug in the brain. Maybe this compound goes more in one place or the other. So that is not the case. We have formally excluded this possibility. Both compounds go into all regions of the brain pretty much in the same way. So then the other question, OK, if it's not a compound, then it must be something that may be perhaps genetically encoded. So how to um, uh, approach this? Uh, well, uh, so and here the idea was, okay, maybe we can actually look at what is known about spatial transcriptomics uh, and then map uh, and ask for each gene what is uh, the, the overlap between the expression of a specific gene and uh, the efficaciousness of the therapy. And this is what was done here. And it's very nice to see that base comes up very highly. And this is what you expect, you know, because if you put in a base inhibitor, you, you would expect that uh, the, the drug acts where base is expressed. I mean, if the drug acts in a place where there is no base, then there is a problem here. And uh, so, so this is very reassuring. And um, Thai-1 is also what you expect because APPPS1, the, the transgene that is being used here is under control of the Thai-1 promoter. So again, the transgene is driven by Thai-1, so you, you see that there is an overlap between uh, uh, the efficaciousness of the therapy and the expression of Thai-1. All of this is very, very reassuring, but these are controls. 
So, and then the question is, of course, uh, what else do you find? And I tell you, it's amazing. We, we find an entire network of uh, uh, very, very interesting genes. Uh, you know, new regulin, uh, SNAP25 uh, is, uh, uh, is the snare complex, uh, the um, presynaptic complex, and you have the myelin basic protein that is very, very highly expressed. And what we're doing here, here we're mapping uh, the efficaciousness of, of the polythiophin against the efficaciousness of the base uh, uh, inhibitor. And now we can see actually that uh, uh, the overlap uh, uh, of the genes is completely different. Here for the, for the base inhibitor, you have, you have mostly oligodendrocytic genes. You have myelin-based protein, proteolipid protein. And here you have, uh, for, the, for the polythiophin, you have mostly neuronal genes. Uh, so, so all of this, uh, I think, uh, you know, we are at the beginning of this, but I think this shows you how powerful this can be because, because now you are combining morphology with molecular information.